Greetings to all of you who've joined us online for this week's small group Bible study here at Oakland Heights Baptist Church. I'm Nita Rogers. I'm blessed to be the teacher of a loving and faithful small group of senior adult ladies. And I just want to take a minute to say to them if they're watching in, I miss you. I love you. I miss your smiles and your hugs. I miss the fellowship that we have in our classroom, which is where I am today taping this lesson. And pretty soon, maybe we'll be back together. I hope you're doing what your children tell you to do. Our lives have sort of flip-flopped with this um, catastrophe that we're involved in. And so the parents are having to listen to their children. And we have to remember to wash our hands, stay at home, uh, obey our, our children. Uh, it's just been a different kind of a, of a time in our lives. But we can do it. Uh, change is always hard, but we can make the changes. The lesson today that uh, we are studying is the Easter lesson from the 24th chapter of Luke. And uh, this is just one scene in the whole weekend of the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So Luke gives us his view of what events took place. To really get the whole picture of the resurrection, we need to study Matthew 28, Mark 16, and the 20th and 21st chapters of John. We harmonize that to get a total picture of all the events that took place around the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Let's read the 24th chapter of Luke, the first 12 verses. If you have a Bible, read along, and I'm reading from the NIV. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, Suddenly, two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb, bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. The unbelieving and secular world mocks Christians today for their belief in a man who died and was raised back to life again. They seem to think that we're too weak to live without some kind of hope for the future, and so they laugh at us for believing in the resurrection. But there are two, the Christian faith is founded on two major, historic, verifiable events. We know the first one to be the crucifixion of Christ. We know that he was arrested, interrogated, uh, went through several illegal trials, brutal beatings, and then he was forced to be nailed to a cross and hang there until he was dead. That sounds pretty frightening to us today and to the general world at large. But you and I know that when Jesus hung on that cross and shed his precious sinless blood, we know that that provided forgiveness for our sins. Scripture says that without uh, the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. So when Jesus hung on that cross, it was for our benefit to pay the price for our sins, for the forgiveness of the sins of all mankind, past, present, and future. The second major event that we base our Christian faith on is the resurrection of Christ. Someone said when Christ died on the cross, hell screamed and heaven shouted. 
but the resurrection came three days later, and uh, we know that he was raised from the tomb. Worldwide religions have places where they go to honor their leaders, but their graves, their tombs, their shrines, their monuments, one uh, movement in our world even has its leader encased in glass so that when you go to honor and worship and praise your leader, you view a place of the dead. You see the dead. Not so with our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Scholars tell us there's more evidence for the re resurrection of Jesus Christ than there is for the assassination of Julius Caesar on the Ides of March. And what school child ever questioned the fact that Caesar was stabbed to death by his uh, traitorous friends on the steps of the Roman Senate. We just accept that as fact. But there's more fact to prove that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. We know that our faith is not a leap into the dark. It's not wishful thinking. It's based on evidence that we can rely on. Actually, when we take a step of faith, we step out onto the rock of the foundation of Jesus Christ. I want us to talk today about five proofs that I believe the scriptures show us of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see two of them, actually about three, in this passage that we read today. The first one is the empty tomb. I've brought a model of the tomb. It has a special place in my heart. Uh, when my husband finished 50 years of gospel ministry, he got a group together to celebrate, and we made a trip to the Holy Land. While we were in a gift shop in Jerusalem near the garden tomb, one of the group members found this replica of the tomb, the garden tomb. And uh, it plays a big part in my Easter decorations. I always leave the stone in front of the entry to the tomb until the first thing on Sunday morning. And before I make coffee or start breakfast, I go to this tomb and I lovingly and joyfully roll the stone away because I know that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And you can take the top off of it. My group has seen this before because I try to use it almost every year and the top is does come off. But you can tell the tomb is empty. <clears throat> There's no body there. There's no... Um, place where we would go to worship a dead Christ. So the empty tomb. The women here in, the <clears throat> in this passage had been at the cross on Friday. They had stood around and watched as Jesus died, and then they had seen Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea take the body of Jesus off the cross at the permission of the uh, officials and carry it hurriedly before sunset down to Joseph's new tomb in a garden that was nearby Calvary. They laid the body wrapped in a linen cloth, scripture tells us, on a slab inside the tomb. And the stone was rolled down a trench, massive stone, to block the entryway so that scavenger dogs or grave robbers would not be able to disturb it. The women also, they knew about the stone, but they also knew about the seal that was put on it and the guard that was set in front of the tomb so that Jesus' body would not be tampered with. So on Sunday morning, as soon as the daylight began, they took more spices to, I think, finish a proper burial for the Lord that they loved so much. It was done hurriedly because it, this was Passover season. And at sunset on Friday, everything stopped while they celebrated Passover. But early on Sunday morning, a group of women, different uh, gospel writers give them different names, but we know that they went with their spices to finish preparing the body of Jesus properly for his burial. Well, sometimes, you know, women have these big plans and uh, we know exactly what we want to do, but we uh, don't think about the obstacles maybe we might meet. So on the way to the tomb, the women began to say to each other, who's going to roll that stone away? It was going to be a problem. But when they got to the tomb, they, did, they found the stone had been rolled away. We know an earthquake happened. The angel moved the stone away and Jesus came out of the tomb. But they did not expect to see an empty tomb. The stone was rolled away. 
but they did not expect to see an empty tomb. There was no body there. And so they uh, confronted two angels, men in shining garments. And the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? I just think that's one of the greatest questions that we really don't ever consider. The angel said, why are you in a graveyard looking for a living Lord? And the answer was, he is not here, he is risen. And then the angels reminded them that Jesus had prophesied this and had taught them this while they walked and served with him through all those years. The second thing that comes along is what happened when the women went back to tell the disciples that the tomb was empty. You know, women were not accepted as credible witnesses in that day. I guess because they were too emotional, too airhead or whatever, that uh, they were not considered in a, any trials as credible witnesses. And so the, the men said that they thought that sounded to them like nonsense. This is the only time in the, in the New Testament that that word is used. It can also be used to describe someone who is delirious with a high fever. And you know about that. They could hallucinate, they could imagine, they could dream up something if they were delirious. And that's the way the men viewed what the women had told them. But they went to make sure. Uh, so Peter and John went to the tomb. Other writers tell us that Peter went right in, John looked in, saw that it was the tomb was empty, but he did not go in immediately. That brings us to the second proof. The empty tomb is a verifiable fact. There was no body in that tomb. The second thing is what Peter and John saw when they went inside the tomb. They saw grave clothes. You know that they had wrapped Jesus in linen. Most bodies were wrapped in strips of linen, interspersed with spices, very much like what we think of a mummy looking like, the shape of the body tightly wound in, in linen strips and laid on that slab. Well, the interesting thing, Peter saw the grave clothes lying there. They were lying there. John saw the grave clothes lying there, no body in them. But John also says that he saw the head covering, the napkin that was put over the head of a corpse. He saw it folded and lying separately from the grave clothes. In my heart, I like to think that Jesus sat up, stood up, out of his grave clothes, took that napkin off his face, neatly folded it and put it down. When Jesus came out of the grave, he left behind everything that reminded him and that would remind us of death. He left death behind. And when he came out of the grave, he left all the trappings of the dead. That was the second proof that we had. Something had happened there in that tomb. If a person had fought his way out of those grave clothes, they would have been scattered everywhere. They would not have been lying in the place where the disciples found them. Leads me to a third proof, and that is all of the post-resurrection appearances that Jesus made after he was resurrected. You know, for about 40 days, he appeared to individual disciples. He appeared to groups of disciples uh, to prove that it was the same person that died on the cross. Do you remember the first person that confronted Jesus, didn't, uh, didn't recognize him at first, was Mary Magdalene. And she thought he was the gardener in the mist and the fog of early morning in a garden. Uh, Mary did not know that the man she looked at was the Lord until he called her name. And he said, Mary. And when he called her name, she immediately recognized it. It's a wonderful thing when you hear Jesus call your name. Maybe not verbally, maybe audibly, but in our hearts, we hear Jesus call us by our name. He knows us. The scripture says he knows his own. And then he appeared to the disciples that evening in a room and he spoke a word. Do you remember the first word that he spoke to his disciples? Peace. Wouldn't you love to hear Jesus speak peace in our world today? Don't we have millions of people who need to hear Jesus speak peace 
into their hearts. Some people are so panicked, so fearful. They need the Lord Jesus, the living Lord, to speak peace in their hearts. And so he spoke to the, the uh, uh, disciples in the upper room. The next Sunday night, he appeared to what, when Thomas was present with the disciples, and he offered a tangible body for Thomas to feel, a proof that he was really alive. He was not a spirit. He was not a ghost. He was a real person. His voice, his, his looks, his appearance, his message was still the same as it had been when they followed along with him in those days of service in his ministry. Then, if you recall, way over into the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul says that at one time, Jesus appeared to more than 500 people on the mount who saw him, who heard him, who knew he was alive. Um, Attorney Ed Merritt did this lesson last week, and uh, if I went into his office and told him that I had been charged with robbery at Texas Bank and Trust uh, and asked him if he would represent my case, then I would follow by telling Ed, now I want you to understand, I have 500 eyewitnesses that can come into court and tell the court that I was not at Texas Bank and Trust when it was robbed. I have witnesses to prove that it wasn't me. I think Ed could get me off. I think the judge would drop the charges. I believe he's that good a lawyer, especially if he had 500 eyewitnesses to a case. Can't we believe that we have a living Jesus when 500 people saw him bodily and we know he bodily ascended into heaven as well? Those are appearances that we find in the scriptures. I want to finish with two more that I think are such good evidences of a living Christ. And the first one is the transformation of the disciples. What happened to those guys? On Friday, they were nowhere to be found. The only person at the cross with Jesus was John, and he got the responsibility of taking care of Jesus' mother. The rest of them were gone. They were afraid they'd be arrested and drug off and imprisoned or even crucified like Jesus was. So they were nowhere to be found. But after Jesus appeared for the 40 days, and then after they spent time in prayer in the upper room in Jerusalem, we see those men indwelled with the resurrected Christ, and we see them standing in the middle. Peter stood in the middle of thousands of people and proclaimed that they had crucified Jesus, but God had raised him from the dead. And it was such a powerful message that he presented that the people said, well, what are we going to do about it? This has happened, but what do we do about it? And Peter said, repent and put your faith in the Lord Jesus and be baptized to, to prove that your life has been changed. They were changed. They were transformed. The disciples went all over, all over the known world. One of them went to South India and was killed with a spear. They tell us Thomas took the gospel to India. Another went to Africa and died a martyr there. And the rest of the disciples went all over the known Roman world telling people that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the Son of God, crucified for our sins and raised for our salvation. They went all over the world doing that. The only way you can explain that is that they knew a crucified and resurrected living Jesus Christ. And they followed the commission that he gave them to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, the last thing that I believe is the probably my most uh, important evidence that Jesus is alive today is the presence in the world today of a loving, living, growing New Testament church. How do you explain the church of the Lord Jesus Christ unless we have a living leader? Jesus said, I will build my church. And you remember, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell didn't prevail against Jesus, did they? And the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of the Lord Jesus. The church has had its enemies through the centuries, religions that have tried to stamp it out, world leaders that have tried to stamp it out. And there is a movement in our country today 
of people who hate the church, who hate the name of Jesus, who would destroy it if they could. But that's in the hands of a living and resurrected Lord. So we have outside enemies. But you know, the church has enemies on the inside. We have people who come into the church professing to be born again people. And they've come into the church to spread false teaching. The New Testament talked about it a lot. Paul warned the Galatians about people who would come in with false doctrines, teaching people that the grace of God is not enough, but you have to add works to your faith in Christ. Jesus didn't do it all. He didn't pay it all on the cross. And we have to continue to show that we love and serve him with our works. Other people come into the church to build a kingdom of their own. They have an agenda. They like to have followers, and they come into the church thinking that that's where they can build their own kingdom. And people follow them even to a suicidal death. Most of the younger people are not familiar with the name of Jim Jones, but Jim Jones had hundreds of people who drank poisoned Kool-Aid. That's where the phrase comes, don't drink the Kool-Aid. But they followed Jim Jones to their deaths, women, men, and children, hundreds of them in the jungle of uh, South America. They come in to build their own kingdom. Others come in to make money, to get prosperous. They think that Christian people are so naive that they will just give their money if somebody promises them prosperity or health or things like that. The church has withstood external enemies and internal enemies, and the church has survived. Now, why is that? It's because of the power of a resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. So five proofs, the empty tomb, the undisturbed grave clothes, the appearances of Jesus, the transformation of the disciples, and then the presence of the church in our day, all make perfectly clear to me that Jesus Christ came out of the tomb, a living, eternally alive Savior of the world. Well, what does that mean to you? Well, to me, it means that when I wake up every day, I have resurrection power present in my life by the Holy Spirit who came to live in my heart when I was eight years old. I've had that power of Jesus. I haven't always acknowledged it, and I haven't always lived by it, but it's been present in my life. It also gives me power to live over my circumstances. It's amazing to me how Christians who serve a victorious Savior can be so defeated in the circumstances of their lives. And it's because we don't rely on the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And then it also tells me that there's a hope for the future. And it is not a leap into the dark. It is a solid foundation on which I stand. If I have a Savior, Jesus said, I'm the resurrection and the life he that believes in me, though he dies, will live again. I believe there is eternal life after we leave this present life that we have. And that hope comes to me through a resurrected Christ. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living no matter what men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for your awesome presence in our lives every day. We thank you for the way you give us power and abilities to do your will. We know, Lord, that when we serve you, we are effective because you work through us and in us. I pray you bless all those who are watching today. I pray you'd give us resurrection life, a view of life from outside the tomb, and know that our Lord will see us through all the way to the end, to the last breath we breathe, and then on into eternity. Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings, all the things you do for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.